Hi, my name's Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Now, Insight is a show where we usually discuss books on politics, both domestically and internationally, uh, sometimes books on history that provide some insight into the presence, and sometimes some broader atmospheric or developmental books to give a feeling of trends we should be aware of. Uh, today's book uh, is a very well-known and has become something of a classic uh, on how to take a look at international relations. It's written by a man named uh, Samuel Huntington, and the book is called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order. This was uh, published back in 1996, but uh, a number of articles are showing how the book has had some significant uh, impact on the thinking process of members of the Trump presidency. So Steve Bannon, who was uh, there as sort of a strategist for uh, Trump and is now out, he frequently would refer to the book, and it received then a lot of attention. Now, uh, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Benjamin Harris. To Benjamin's right is Carol Tunis. And to Carol's right is Lucas Walker. So I wanted to read a brief opening quote from the book and then get your opinions of it. The author writes, The years after the Cold War witnessed the beginnings of dramatic changes in people's identities and the symbols of those identities. Global politics began to be reconfigured along cultural lines. In the post-Cold War, flags count and so do other symbols of cultural identity, including crosses, crescents, and even head coverings, because culture counts, and cultural identity is what is most meaningful to most people. People are discovering new but often old identities and marching under new but often old flags, which lead to wars with new but often old enemies. What I put away from this is once the Cold War ended, cultures across the world came out of this constant state of fear and started speaking out and standing up for something they believed in. They realized the fight wasn't with their neighboring country, but it was actually within their own country they called home. So what I thought about it is that people realized that they didn't um, have, um, um, how do you say it? Before the Cold War or during the Cold War, they were either aligned or non-aligned. They were either on the Russian side or on the European side. So after that, it was kind of t uh, taken away from their identity. So they were searching for a new identity. And that's how they fell back on their old cultural values and um, also religion that is coming up again. Yeah, you did see a lot of uh, new cultures arise after the Cold War ended. Um, it was important to really pay attention to, um, to these cultures because after the Cold War they became uh, major actors in global politics. Um, if you understand how these cultures think and act, it will really just help you get a clear picture on how um, international relations kind of works. I like a quote that he uses. He says, in the post-Cold War world, for the first time in history, global politics has become multipolar and multi-civilizational. During most of human existence, contacts between civilizations were intermittent or non-existent. And so I think that that feeling when he's used in the clash of civilizations is that what modernization has done is brought people closer together, but not always for the right reasons. Yeah, not always the right reasons we do come together, but it's always like you, we made in the opening quote. It's going back to our old traditions and our values that really draw us together as a, and find us as a culture or on a broad scale as a civilization. And we, we stand up for what we believe in, and what is right, what is wrong, and ultimately just come together, common core values. So um, I do think that it did bring us together in the civilization itself, but um, this made us also um, look more um, not together, so there were more civilizations that 
had their own identity and that way we were um, separated more. So there was a more clear uh, separation between civilizations. Yeah, we're all unique. Each culture has their norms. Um, like most cultures will agree that murder is bad. Um, but also all cultures, you know, have things that set them apart from other ones. And that's what we all need, like respect. All right. Uh, but I think what he's also doing is seeing that this may be heightened the potential for conflict. Uh, because as part of that civilization, one of the things he seems to be pointing to is at the core of a lot of these civilizations is religion. So that religion tends to be rising up uh, to a greater importance and that tends to contribute to greater tension and potential conflict. Uh, and some of it I think is also because at the same time that he's talking about a clash of civilizations, He's sort of feeling there's something called maybe the decline of the West. So that uh, he's saying, and this decline of the West is, uh, while he's used in terminology like that, it isn't always easy to define what that clearly means outside of the fact that you're not having maybe the same type of influence to get your way that you would have during the Cold War era. Yeah, talking about the declining in the West, what I think he was meaning was the econ we, in the West, our economy has kind of been stagnant, high employment uh, rates, while in the East, Asia's economic uh, has been taken, or economy has been taken off. It, they, you know, the, the center of the financial market now is Asia, East Asia, with uh, Tokyo and uh, Beijing and uh, areas in just the East with an uh, uprise in their economy. And another thing we see in the West declining is that English is um, sort of being moved away from uh, internationally as more, uh, as China becomes more prominent in the world economy and as a uh, superpower, more people believe that um, we will move to Mandarin in the future as the world language um, for international business and international relations. When, when he's discussing these civilizations, he's sort of feeling there's a Western, uh, which I guess he means mainly United States, Canada, and Western Europe, and then he's sort of feeling that Latin America is a sort of a separate civilization, and then you have China and Japan and uh, the Middle East, uh, and then you have uh, Russia and sort of Eastern Europe, and more or less I think this is what he's sort of feeling are groupings, and the groupings are sort of cultural and language and in some cases religious, uh, but religion matters differently in different sort of areas how you're looking at it. And that's where he gets to the Middle East and feels that in terms of the Middle East that religion really matters and elevates uh, the Middle Eastern religion. Yeah, the Middle Eastern religion with Islam, it really took off because during the time period, there was no, during the time period it took off, was there was no rival to them. They were just, their primitive civilization, not only high intellectual uh, strength was there. So that religion took off because no one could really stand up against it and it influenced many of the younger um, adults there between 18 and 29, which would have an impact on it and in creating this uh, religious movement in the Middle East. I also feel like they uh, felt the need for religion more because um, when their population got bigger and bigger, the youth like got un unemployed and um, they started urbanizing more. So um, also Huntington says when people modernize, uh, urbanize, they feel the need to grasp onto an, an identity and um, to I feel the need for a more social um, support, and that is what religion gives them. And I think that's why the Islam is coming up in the Middle East a lot too. Yeah, because he refers to the idea that uh, you're going to have movement to the cities, mm -hmm. and so mobility. And those two factors sort of are what he sees as the biggest one related to a religious revivalism, and that he's seeing that's what's happening in the Middle East. You're having these mass movements of people, that mobility, and then movement to the cities. So as a result, he's sort of seeing that as related to a religious revival. Um, through all this, he's, uh, I guess, uh, trying to downplay 
the notion that we're just looking at a country versus a country, but in this broader uh, civilization clash, and as a result, it tends to create a greater complexity of how we identify things. Yeah, there's another uh, good quote from the book I liked. It was, uh, we know who we are only when we know who we are not, and often only when we, whom we are against. What I took away from this quote was, um, with the culture clashes right now, it's huge between Western Europe and America's against um, the radical Islam organizations. Mm -hmm. We see this today throughout our uh, culture um, with the rise of the, their beliefs and our beliefs clashing, which is pretty much what is going on throughout not just our country, like I said, Western Europe, and they're even making it down into Australia with their, their clashing our beliefs against their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the notion, again, the Cold War, it sort of it covered over because you had this ideological clash, and so you had two major superpowers, the United States and the then Soviet Union, which subsequently collapses and doesn't exist anymore. So as a result, you, you tended to see everything in sort of an ideological East versus West way, and once that ends, it takes a while for the emergence of uh, sort of this new world order where we're still trying to figure out where it's heading. I don't get the feeling from reading the book he's got some sort of definite feel. He's just saying developments are still underway. During the Cold War, many uh, students and practitioners of international relations, they developed this uh, simple uh, map of the world that defined the political ide ideologies and it simplified different cultural backgrounds and how they aligned to superpowers. It gave uh, scientists and world leaders perspective on how each country's culture was shaped. Pretty much this model of global politics was essential as starting a point, uh, starting point for the thinking about international affairs and shape world pol politics for two gener generations. Um, so, again, um, religion seems to play this very dominant role, and I think, but not everywhere, and so. It matters when he's looking at Latin America, he's saying you know, we think of it as Christian in the Catholic sense, but it's more Protestant than Catholics, even though it's Christian. But then when we get to the Middle East, uh, suddenly, and he feels this was sort of covered up under the Cold War, because again, you had these different camps. So now religion is, is emerging uh, and some of that he sort of associated with what he called the youth bulge, that there's this big uh, part of the Middle East that is made up of younger people under the age of, say, 20, and that they seem to be a bigger percentage of uh, Middle Eastern society than is the case with some of the other civilizations. So he's trying to figure out where this all is taking anyone. Yeah, throughout history, religion has always been kind of a... Uh divider amongst people. Um, obviously people believe um, in the religion wholeheartedly and uh, in most cases are willing to fight for it. So I believe that is what makes civilizations clash the most. And um, Yeah, it's also that um, like technical issues you can dissolve really easily. You can debate mm. about it and dissolve. But religion issues and really cultural issues, the way our civilizations are divided According to Huntington, it's really hard to actually debate about it and um, like dissolve these problems. The the whole notion of encountering another civilization, uh, he spends time in the book trying to say that's what makes this clash unique is that previously you had this isolated interaction among different civilizations or between civilizations, but that. Uh, all that has now changed, so you're having regular interactions between and among different civilizations, and so as a result, the potential for some sort of conflicts uh, emerge. I don't know whether you'd call it another world war. He's not quite clear, but I think he's sort of saying there's some possibility for tensions leading to conflicts, therefore some type of uh, you know, military activity. Yeah, the problem after the, the Cold War and was dealing with the identity crisis, and um, it was no more the question of what side are you on. It was more, who are you? They they went through this identity crisis because during that time, everyone supported the the beliefs of the you know 
the, the East with Russia, the Soviet Union, or the West with Europe and America with democracy or communism, communism spreading down to the, down to the peninsula of Korea and into you know, the eastern part of, uh, or the western part of Russia, was in our, the Soviet what is now, like Ukraine and all through there, when it broke up. So everybody was just struggling to f define who they were, and we went back to the quote in the beginning of the book. Um, often they f went back to old cultures, you know, their traditional culture, they fell back on that. When um, he, he discussed the idea that we went from this period called the expansion of the West, so we were under the uh, impression that modernization also meant that as countries modernized, they were somehow going to adopt some sort of a Western model. And he says, so now you've gone from this idea of the expansion of the West to the revolt against the West. And so this shift has taken place during this post-Cold War period. So we're realizing that other civilizations may want to modernize, but they're not looking at any Western model. And he's certainly pointing to the Chinese that they're, they're modernizing, but they're not using any Soviet model. They rejected the Soviet model, where they were had a link to the Soviet Union at one point, but they sort of scrapped that. And even in Japan, he talks about the importance of cultural identity as part of how the Japanese are going through modernization. Yeah, um, I think that um, after the Cold War, a lot of people um, really just started to um, try and find peace. They didn't want to um, escalate to conflicts. They um, had seen those before in, um, in the past and just didn't want to you know, do that again. So they tried, they each had their individual um, civilizations and cultures, but they tried to um, agree on stuff so they didn't have to react um, bad. He, um, he talks about, uh, is there something that might merge eventually called like a universal civilization? So we're coming together. Uh, and he says that while we may share certain types of things in common with some other civilizations, I don't think he's seeing that be emerging and he doesn't see it's ever going to happen so that you're going to have this sort of more of this awareness of attention between these different types of civilization. Yeah, I don't think there would be a, a universal situation because we're just, there's too many differences in between our cultures and their cultures. One being religion. Our, the religion is pretty much the identity of a culture. It d defines who the civilization is. Secondly, our language is totally different. We can't come together. We have too many different indifferences. And ultimately, what, like I said in the first, is religion that's going to separate us both because our, our religious beliefs really are our core values to what we believe in in politics and defines who we are. Also, what I thought was interesting is um, how he talks about basic values that he's talking about how all people in uh, all over the world have the same values, like murder is wrong all the basic ones, but um, that doesn't make us one um, civilization, that just makes us human. Mm. I thought that was really interesting of him. And then um, also he uh, was talking about how the Western con consumption and our popular culture spreads all over the world, yet he refutes this by um, saying that cultural interests are not the same as, um, are not the basics of a civilization, so I thought those were really interesting points that he made. I agree. I don't think we'll ever have a universal situation or civilization, so to speak. Um, I believe there will be pockets of different civilizations um, interacting with other ones. As you know, the technology age makes it easier for us to access certain things from different countries, um, like s music, um, art, stuff like that. So I think that we will um, essentially share values um, with other countries and other civilizations, but um, I, I really can't see us all coming together and uniting as one. Yeah, I think he sort of was saying that uh, there was that belief it might emerge out of modernization so that everybody wants to modernize and to some extent you don't want to remain backward. Uh, but then we made that sort of assumption that with modernization came westernization and now we're realizing, well, they may want to modernize, but they don't necessarily want to westernize. And so you're having this sort of a conflict in the idea of, and he constantly points to China and Japan in that sense of saying they're modernizing, but not necessarily westernizing. 
Yeah, like you said earlier, with the, they wanted to separate from the Western uh, society and their political ideology because they felt like their uh, economic growth could be contributed to their cultural values, and they soon thought that their economic development would surpass the West if they just believed in what they traditional values of what they had in, and it would eventually overcome the West's uh, ideology. Yeah, I believe that uh, other countries are going to want to move away from Western influence. Um, I don't think that they've, I mean, they've, they've had our influence in the past when America and all the other superpowers are kind of colonizing everywhere. And as you saw those revolutions um, and people moving away from American influence, I, I don't think they're going to want to come back as they continue to modernize in the future. The, the notion of uh, some sort of limitations have been reached with Western civilization or it's in decline is he's meaning this sort of like relative so that at one point they had uh, a greater share of the world's wealth now because of the growth of modernization and other civilizations then their share of world wealth is declining. But at the same time I think where he's also pointing to the potential for conflict is that a lot of the natural resources we may need uh, come from other civilizations and so the difficulty we may run into is trying to have that need to have them to help us stay uh, prosperous. Yeah, the natural resource, that's going to be a conflict I think down the line right now I would think would be later on the line would be fresh water would come into mind when how can we deal with getting this fresh water to our people so we're going to have to look at how we can maybe to adopt this universal civilization idea, maybe not necessarily to the full extent of we all under this one civilization, but how can we work with one another? How can we get this problem solved? We need to get past our differences and come to a, co a common solution. Yeah, as resources become more scarce in the future, um, I believe that you know, civilizations will become violent towards each other as they fight for what's left. Um, I, I could see as you know, we start looking for more water, for more land to raise crops that's fertile. I think that, um, yeah, these civilizations are really just going to come together and clash. Yeah, I, uh, uh, that seems to be what, if we, so that's sort of a dire circumstance, but that as a result, if you're having to have modernization everywhere, then sooner or later, every one of these civilizations in order to sustain modernization is going to need natural resources that are located in other civilizations. And so as a result of that, then that might have some potential to cause some problems. And so I think this is what he's pointing to. He's sort of seeing this particularly with China, which he's saying they're growing very well, and as a result they're going to have a greater need for more natural resources from other parts of the world, other civilizations. But then we're going to also have a need for some of those same natural resources. So as a result, how you're seeing this greater interaction that's taking place between and among civilizations. Yeah, he kind of broke it down into the way these zones or civilizations are. There's zones of peace and zones of turmoil. And the zones of peace you're going to see with these countries or these cultures, they're more modernized or developed. And the zones of turmoil, they're poor countries are underdeveloped. So the resources there, you know, in the, the zones of turmoil, they're always going to be fighting for these. It's going to be a scarcity there. You know, the zones of peace where we're going to see this modernized, modernized, modernized culture, they're not going to be so inclined to fight with each other, going to get along with each other and have a better understanding how to d distribute these resources. What's also um, interesting to see is how it gets more dangerous for the Western people, obviously, because um, since the Soviet Union uh, ceased to exist there, um, the army also ceased. And um, I mean, the Western military is relatively not growing as strong as the East Asian ones. And um, when we're talking about conflict, this can be a real problem for us. The, uh, that notion then that you're having the resource tension mm -hmm. combined with the fact that uh, after the Cold War, religion becomes more important or more visibly important in certain sectors of the world is what he seems to be seeing as this clash is centered around these sort of two things. 
seem to be the core of how he's pointing to a potential clash. But, I, I mean, he's not trying to be sort of uh, doom and gloom that it's inevitably leading to war on some massive scale, but that it has the potential for conflict in which he's simply trying to understand how it might come about. Yeah, religion, like as we said already before, is a big, it's a, it's a hot topic in our culture. And what happens when a certain set of beliefs from one culture clashes with another set of beliefs, you were ultimately we have a war possibly it's going to break out because they don't necessarily believe in our ideas and we don't believe in theirs we only have a few minutes left well what do you think of this book and do you recommend it to a tv audience yeah i thought the book was great it's very difficult read before i, I would uh recommend you understand the chapter for progressing to the next chapter if not reread it and make sure you know what's going on in this uh, that chapter because it kind of all ties together as it further uh develops yeah, I think he's a really good writer because he, he's writing really structured and it's easy to take out the key points because he always um, he always goes like um, first, second, third. That makes it really easy for me to read it. It's also pretty impressive how he kind of predicts the future. Yeah, Huntington's a very good uh, writer. He understands inter international relations really well. We actually um, used this book in one of my international relations class before. Um, I do agree it is kind of a tough read. Um, you got really got to buckle down, um, slow down, and, and really understand each chapter, like you said, before moving on. Because it can, if you, if you miss a chapter, you know, even a page, it gets kind of confusing. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a theoretical book. Uh, and he's trying to lay out a, a scheme of how to take a look at international relations and interactions among countries and civilizations. Huntington has uh, subsequently died, but he wrote for years on political science. I remember reading his stuff back in the 1960s. But it's interesting how uh, the Trump administration sort of is heralding this book, and so people are going back now to read it to get some insight into how uh, the Trump people might be looking at the world around them and certainly what Trump is uh, doing is in some ways saying some of the things that Huntington is saying because Trump tends to always do this us versus them. Everything with him is very black and white. It's absolute we, us against you, you against us. And in some ways Huntington is sort of saying this is what happens with civilizations in conflict. You tend to get an us versus them them against us and so as a result it's the potential for conflict to be there more than figuring out ways of getting along. So a difficult book to work yourself through but one that I think is very uh, useful to try to get a grasp on how to see the world around us. So thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.